The year was 1908. Theodore Roosevelt was the President of the United States. Postage stamps had just gone up to two cents. In 1908, rolls of stamps were introduced for the first time because of these new vending machines they had, and it made it easier for the machines not to lock up and jam. And for the 1908 New Year, someone came up with a wonderful idea of dropping this lighted ball from the building to introduce the New Year. When the fellow thought it was time to drop the ball, they lowered it with a rope, thus starting a tradition that still survives today. President Roosevelt established the Grand Canyon National Monument in 1908 and said, keep it for your children and your children's children and for all who come after you as one of the great sights which every American, if he can travel at all, should see. Well, in 1908, this man here, Henry Ford, certainly did his part to see the Grand Canyon. The Model T started to roll off the assembly lines. And because of the assembly line, he was able to sell these cars at a much lower price where the average family could afford them. I especially like this photo of how these bodies went on the chassis. And as you can see from this advertisement, the price was right. And if you didn't happen to have the complete price, well, you can have fun with a Ford. Pay while you play. In other words, you can make payments as you go along driving your little Ford. Henry Ford said this, I will build a car for the great multitude. It will be large enough for the family, but small enough for the individual to run and care for. It will be constructed of the best materials, by the best men to be hired after the simplest designs that modern engineering can devise. But it will be so low in price that no man making a good salary will be unable to own one and enjoy with his family the blessing of hours of pleasure in God's great open spaces. And one of those great open spaces was the St. Clair River. Henry Ford hadn't figured out how to make those Model Ts float. So it was left to entrepreneurs like Johnny Bowl out of Sarnia to take his uh, little barge and put a car on it and take one across at a time. This worked out pretty well for about 15 years uh, while the registration in Port Jordan and Sarnia was low. But eventually it seemed like everyone had a car in Port Jordan and Sarnia and so uh, they had to change their methods. Now, of course, there had to be a better way to take them across the river, and so they have the auto ferries and uh, to carry passengers as well as autos. And we see one here. This is the city of Sarnia at Dock. The city of Sarnia was the name of the ferry, but this was the port here at Dock. Now, the only problem was it only had enough room for about 25 cars. And you can see how many cars there are here just waiting in line, so... It wasn't uh, rapid deployment by any means. And if you had a couple uh, trucks on board, you would even get 25 uh, vehicles on the ferry. Car ferry service actually began on July 31st, 1923 with the Little Ariel, a riverboat which had operated in the Detroit River between Walkerville, Ontario and Detroit. The Ariel, which accommodated only 20 cars, was sold in 1924 to be put in service between Port Chiron and Sarnia. In this picture here, you'll see that it looks a little different than the previous picture. She was remodeled and uh, well, kind of brought up to speed, more or less, uh, since it was part of the Port Chiron and Sarnia ferry fleet now. I imagine it didn't take long to become overwhelmed with the number of cars there were. So she was quickly joined by the city of Sarnia and uh, later, the city of Port Huron. This is the city of Port Huron. All three of these ferries was owned by James McTaggart. None of these ferries were brand new. They were all owned by uh, other companies for other cities. The city of Port Huron was originally the Duluth, which is pictured here. Later, she was sold and renamed the city of Sheboygan. She operated between Sheboygan, St. Ignace, Mackinac Island, and Point of Arcs. In 1924, she was sold to the Port Huron Sarnia Ferry Company and remodeled and renamed to 
to the city of Port Sharon. She ferried between these two cities until the new Blue Water Bridge was opened in 1939. Lying idle, she sank at dock on April 1, 1939 at Clyde Street. And the city of Sarnia uh, was originally the Garland, uh, which is pictured here. And they were renovated and remodeled uh, to uh, McTaggart's specifications. And they turned into pretty good looking ferries. Here we see the city of Sarnia taking on some uh, automobiles. And this would have been on the Port Sharon side. As busy as Port Sharon was, Sarnia was just as busy, with just as many cars. This is the Sarnia dock. You can see the line up here. This one here is a postcard uh, showing the lineup for the ferry. This one here is an actual photograph that says a busy day for Sarnia ferries. And here we see the uh, cars being loaded on for the crossing over to Port Sharon. Here's a rare evening shot showing the city of Sarnia at the, at the dock. Quite lit up. Here we see a little advertisement for the ferry service, fastest ferry service on Canadian border. 56 miles northeast of Detroit, large end loading steamers, capacity 10,000 cars per day on the famous Chicago to Boston Highway, all paved via Port Churn and Niagara Falls. It says the capacity is 32 autos. I think those would all have to be roadsters for to get 32 on that. They used to advertise 25 and the boat didn't sink, didn't change sizes, so a little piece of advertisement uh, trickery there, I think. They also say they have uh, room for a thousand passengers. What they don't say here is that there's only uh, room in the lifeboats for about a hundred, so hopefully they're all good swimmers. Speaking of lifeboats, uh, lifeboat safety drills were conducted at the Black River Dock, and this picture here is around 1926. Uh, the fellow on the dock in the middle, that's uh, James McTaggart. He was the owner of the three auto ferries. And of course, the crew were probably getting instructions. Everybody uh, that's a crew member, get into the first lifeboat and let the passengers get into the other one. Perhaps I'm being a little sarcastic, but it seems a shame that uh, there wasn't some laws earlier than the Titanic uh, disaster to make sure there was enough lifeboats uh, on board for the passengers. People were becoming more comfortable with their cars and they would go on longer trips. The cars were being better built. And of course, uh, they had better roads, uh, paved roads, uh, a lot of uh, the main thoroughfares. So the Port Sharon Sarnia Ferry Company wanted folks to know that uh, don't let a little thing like water stop you from going to Chicago or to London. Uh, you can cross right on our ferry system and keep on going. Here's a little advertising blurb. Uh, tells a little bit about the Port Sharon Sarnia ferry system. It says tickets are a dime, or you can get uh, six tickets for 50 cents. It also says that the Port Sharon dock is at the foot of Grand River Avenue and uh, leaves uh, on the 15 after and the 15 to, to the hour. Sarnia Dock was at the foot of Cromwell Street uh, and it leaves uh, on the hour and the half hour. One of the things that they were proud of is that these were uh, steel ferries. And you can see by this photo of the Sarnia Dock that it says steel fireproof ferry. I know the hulls were steel but there was an awful lot of wood above the hull on the cabins. And so I guess they didn't have enough room on the sign to say steel fireproof ferry until there's a fire. When the city of Port Jaren sank at the foot of Clyde Street, I don't show any record of it that it was ever salvaged from there. But when the city of Sarnia sank, uh, it was salvaged as you can see from these next few pictures. Almost all the Port Sharon and Sarnia ferries sank or were scrapped. But the real death of the Port Sharon and Sarnia ferries came in 1938, when the Blue Water Bridge was completed. As residents of Port Sharon, we became very familiar with the Blue Water Bridge uh, and pretty much took it for granted a way to get to Canada. 
But in 1938, uh, it was an engineering marvel that you could just build a bridge across this St. Clair River and drive across and the freighters could go underneath you. It was pretty amazing uh, the first couple times you went over it. People couldn't wait to get across. Uh, this is my dad's car. He's taking a picture here of my mom peeking out the back with my aunt. But you can see because of the barricade it wasn't open yet and that's as close as they could get. But most people were just very anxious to be able to drive across that bridge. And once the bridge was officially open people couldn't wait to get across. I mean there was quite a lineup of cars coming and going. And it didn't take very long for the auto ferries to go out of business. The other ferries kept on running. Uh, and then uh, something happened after the war that uh, most of us, or a lot of us, are familiar with. It was a new type of ferry. This is the ferry that I grew up with. Not at all like the other ferries, quite different in fact. There were two of them, the city of Sarnia, which is shown here, and also the city of Port Huron. And they kept that tradition uh, that was left over from the old ferries. The reason they look so different is that they were never meant to be ferries. These were left over from World War II. As you can see from this document, the ferry was built on the hull of an LCM. LCM stood for Landing Craft Mechanized, which meant that basically they could uh, transport uh, jeeps to the beach and, and small tanks uh, like they had in World War II, not like they would have today. I mean, the ferry wasn't really that big. But in reality, they transferred almost everything to the beach, including infantry. The official name for an infantry landing craft was LCI, but the LCM certainly uh, transferred many troops to shore, among other things such as equipment. On this uh, photo here, if you look at the rear, you'll see where they control the ship from, the wheelhouse. It was basically a box, and inside the box there was the, of course, the steering mechanism. And it was the same box that the ferries were steered from. Uh, it was elevated somewhat so they could see over the cabin that was put on for the passengers. And it was enclosed and had windows. The lifeboat situation wasn't any better with this ferry than it was earlier ferries. This little raft up here that you see on top is all that they had. But in all fairness, they did have life preservers, so I guess if the boat sank, you just were bobbing up and down in the water until the next ferry came along and picked you up. The ferry docks were close to the Military Street Bridge, and uh, it was a common sight to see the ferry there. Uh, I think there was at least one other ferry that they had for a backup. It would be very unusual to see two ferries at the dock at the same time because uh, those ferries should be actually crossing near the middle of St. Clair River. They shouldn't be at the same dock. I remember as a boy going over to Sarnia on the ferry, and it was a pretty big deal. And I could always imagine as that ferry uh, took off for Sarnia and went to the Black River, uh, the engines were low, but as you got close to the St. Clair River, the engines started revving up, and once you hit St. Clair River, they were going full blast. And I could just picture myself in this uh, position right here, at the lead of an Army uh, LCM, going onto the beaches. I was ready. That's me right there, up at the front. Officer in charge, ready to hit the beaches. Or at least that was my daydream as I was going across the St. Clair River. Sometimes we went across to get firecrackers, which we would smuggle back in our pockets. And then sometimes we went across to uh, see if there was any toy soldiers. I, I love toy soldiers of all types. And uh, I went over to Sarnia to see if I could find any. I never did really find any there. But I did find some really neat trucks and armor and guns, uh, air, anti-aircraft guns, uh, which I'm going to show you right here. The ones I'm referring to are on that middle shelf in that narrow long one right there. And yes, I still have them after all these years. Of course, I didn't have enough money to buy them all at one time, but as I saved my money and as the opportunity to go across on the ferry uh, presented itself, I would pick one up or two up and, and bring them back across. I played with them a lot as I was a boy, and I also took good care of them, as you can see here. 
And since we're looking at the shelves in my den, uh, we might as well look at uh, some of the other uh, things on the shelf, mainly the toy soldiers. And perhaps some of you gentlemen remember playing with these soldiers as boys. Uh, I got a lot of use out of these. And uh, reluctantly, I let my children play with them as well, so my collection is only about half as big as it was. Sometimes my boys would use these for target practice. Another time I found one of my sons melting down these lead figures to make sinkers to go fishing with. But I was able to salvage these anyway. Most of these soldiers were picked up at Kresge's, Woolworths, or Newberry's. But some of the better uh, made ones uh, were picked up at J.L. Hudson's at Christmas time in Detroit. I would ask for them as a present. And a few of these were given to me by a collector. These here were actually. The collector that gave me these as a boy was Mr. Mino, who lived in Mr. Boynton's old house on Huron Avenue near the old junior college. He knew I was interested in these, and my dad took me over and showed me his collection. And then he gave me some of his, which I thought was very nice of him. And here we see the ferry boat heading back to Port Sharon from the Sarnia dock. I realized the Blue Water Bridge made it possible to drive across and get to Canada a little easier and more shipping could be done between the two countries. And now that we have two bridges, we can get across twice as fast, or maybe not. It really didn't take very long to get across the river in a ferry, but that was a different era. An era I kind of miss. In our next video, we'll look at some of the city bridges that went across Black River.